All right, moving on to game number two. And game number two by King Hunter. And King Hunter was playing with the black pieces. Just take a quick sip. And then we can get to it. So it's the French. King Hunter with the black pieces playing the French. And knight e2 is not a very not a very common move here, I think, but of course it's possible. Idea is to support the pawn chain of c3. And here took on d4, where I wasn't sure. Um, I'm not that familiar with the theory here, but it seems there's no need to take on d4 already. I don't know if it has any drawbacks, but usually most people go knight c6 first and then maybe queen b6 and they don't take on d4 right now. So you might want to look into the theory here. Takes takes, knight c6, f4, bishop b4 check, king f2, castle. I think this is all fine what you did here in f6. I'm not sure if you were still familiar with this, but it's exactly the right way to play. If the opponent's king is in the center, you want to open up the position to get to him. And here, of course, the king on f2 is quite vulnerable. And if black is able to open up the position, he has very good chance. And here you had a chance to blow up the position completely and put immense practical pressure on your opponent. You play queen b6, but instead the sacrifice, which is very typical in the French, to take the two center pawns, giving a piece and opening up the position. And especially against the king here on f2, black is having great compensation, is actually already objectively better. So this position has been has occurred already in uh, several games and uh, twice white chose bishop d4 but also once queen b3 but now knight g4 check king g1 just take the bishop white cannot take on b4 because of this fork and after queen takes e3 just queen d6 preparing bishop c5 and then trying to get those pawns going forward I mean you have two pawns already for the piece. You have the bishops, you have the center pawns, it's also important, and the white king is in a not so great uh, position, so black is doing absolutely fine here, more than fine. The other move that was played was bishop d4, but now just knight c6. a3, bishop d6 was a, was a game by Cordova, and uh, bishop d6 here preparing e5, e4, and in a practical game, I mean, this is a really difficult position to play for white so this was the way to go um well i don't know if you consider the sacrifice or not also comes back down to uh, candidate moves once again always check those moves that take something and of course which moves do we have here? Not so many, right? Rook takes f3, knight takes e5, this knight takes e5, knight takes d4, that's it. And of course, you can check those moves very quickly, right? Some moves just require seconds, just seconds. But some moves you'll see and be like, hmm, maybe I want to invest more time calculating this. Is this actually possible? And then you start and then you maybe realize, okay, this gives me a great compensation. Of course, you want to be sure before playing such a sacrifice, so you want to see at least, you want to get a good feel for it. Um, but even on like general terms here, getting two center pawns and then with the white king in the center, it just makes sense, right? All right, let's see the game. Queen b6, h4, and here you actually have to take on e5. You actually now have to take on e5 because of the rook f7, your position becomes so difficult. The problem here is you have less space, but that's not the biggest problem. I mean, there's another problem connected to your king. Your king is really weak. And why is that? Because your f pawn is missing. If the f pawns were still on the board, the position wouldn't be, would be pretty normal. Right? If you imagine there would be still an f pawn f7, a pawn f4, okay, you'd be still having a little bit of problems because of your lack of space, due to your lack of space, but it wouldn't be a big deal. But without this f pawn, your king is just so weak. And we'll see this actually in a game. You, you'll come under a tremendous attack. Um, so you need to do something here drastically, otherwise you're just going to be steamed, steamrolled. 
Okay. So rook f7 is not the way to go. And knight d takes e5 is actually at this point it's much more difficult to calculate. But this you had to play this move. It's much more difficult to calculate, um, but it works. It just works. D takes e5 is forced because the knight of course is pinned. And now there's this move d4. The point is if the bishop moves, there's d3 check. Um, winning back the piece because after bishop e3 there's d takes e2. Uh, attacking the white queen on d1 so white has to take on d4 but um, you will win back the piece here bishop c5 threatening bishop takes d4 queen takes d4 rook takes f3 check or queen takes d4 of course king g3 bishop takes d4 now queen takes d4 doesn't work because of rook takes f3 check and then winning the queen so knight takes d4 now uh, rook d8 wins back to peace and you're doing okay okay so probably better for white is knight takes d4 but similar bishop c5 once again king g3 rook d8 but here um okay maybe maybe white can claim a little bit of invention in the, in the end game but of course you have good chance to to defend this end game and uh it's it's not a big problem. A big problem is what we saw in the game. That's a big problem. So knight d takes e4, e5 had to be played here. Um, because like I said, otherwise, when white consolidates and puts his king into a safe, safe space, your pieces are so bad, right? Your knight, what is your knight doing on d7? It's absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. And your bishop is not coming out, your queen, they're all like useless pieces standing around and i've been in a similar situation actually where i've also played some kind of french line the same thing happened to me and i just got just got killed um, so it's very dangerous if you don't free up yourself and you had to free yourself with the sacrifice All right, let's keep going. Rook f7, rook h3, knight f8, king g1, rook c7. Okay, white is just improving, and you can just like wait, right? And here I don't have many, many suggestions because your position is very bad at this point. Probably you should go bishop e7 here to be able to, after knight g5, take this one off then play g6 but I mean you have to do a lot of praying here and, and hope somehow your position will hold and uh, but it's gonna be uphill struggle, struggle for sure knight d8 knight g5 and for white it's so easy to play just attacking right rook g3 king h8 okay now your opponent decided to to do a little sacrifice kind of um, which works but I'm not sure if it really helps uh, him or it was necessary in any way okay doesn't matter we're not looking for uh, your opponent we're looking for you and um, here you had to play bishop c6 which is also a move you want to play, right? You want to get this bishop to this diagonal. Um, maybe you're afraid of d5, but then it comes down to calculation, right? Here after d5, you can take on e5, hit the rook on g g3, hit the pawn d5, just doesn't work for white. So first maybe bishop c6 looks like a losing move because of d5, but then you have to look further. Always calculations, always these small tactics, right? These small tactics, one, two moves, it's always important to see those. Uh, that's just such such a fundamental a skill to have. So I can just recommend to everybody, always, always train your tactics. If you're training anything, if you only have a little bit of time for chess every day or even in a week, then spend it on tactics. It's the best spent training. In terms of chess queen d7 bishop f5 now queen d5 
Queen d5 is also a mistake, but now it gets a little bit, a little bit tricky. Uh, you need to play rook d8 here. And as quickly as possible, put pressure on this pawn on d4 before white gets his attack going and gets this piece into play. For example, now after h5, you could go bishop a5, further put pressure on this pawn and put it in the bishop on b6. And if queen g4, here you can play h5, push the queen away and not allowing white to play h5 himself because if white plays h5 himself, your king feels much more uneasy. Uh, so it's important to play h5 yourself, queen e4, and now move like queen b5. Position remains very complicated, but it looks like you have put up a good blockade for now and white is not crushing through anytime soon and you're definitely in the game. All right, queen d5, queen g4, and once again, h5 should be pl played here. <clears throat> uh, also, white is having a threat right now. The threat is to go bishop e4 followed by d5. And if, if white gets a pawn to d5, it's going to be really difficult because right now your knight is putting up a nice blockade here on e6, right? It's defending a pawn on g7 and everything's good. But if white plays bishop e4 and d5, oh no. Uh, so you had to stop that. You absolutely had to stop that. And rook d8 is not stopping it. But fortunately your opponent didn't play it. You need to play h5 here. And then the best white can do is go bishop e4. h takes, bishop takes d5. And already being in an endgame I think helps you because your king was less safe than the white king. And when your king is less safe then of course it makes sense to take off the queens because with queens king attacks are much more likely. But now you have rook d8 and that's important because here, uh, okay, either white gives up the bishop, which he shouldn't do. It's an important uh, guardian of the light squares, let's call him like that. But after bishop takes b7, you can remove one of these strong connected central pawns and you have good chances here to hold. I mean, still white is clearly better, but this won't be easy to win for white. But after rook d8, like I said, if white plays bishop e4 here, followed by d5, I think it's it's game over. Um, instead, instead your opponent makes a huge blunder, rook c7. Of course you cannot take because of checkmate, but, but, you can first force the queen to move with h5, and h5 is just winning on the spot. Just game over. White can just resign immediately. He's losing a full rook and you're going to be two pieces up. And it's just as simple as that. So this is just candid moves. Just candid moves. Moves that attack something. Always check those moves. Moves that take something. Moves that attack something. If you always check those moves, you will never miss such a move. Right? I mean, I don't know what the time situation was, but uh, just before, in a, at least in a maybe more complicated position, but even in almost any position, it just pays off to scan a position for all the candid moves um, to make sure you don't miss anything, right? Le okay, let's let's do it together. Let's go through the moves that attack something, yeah? Or take something, okay? Queen takes d4, queen takes e5, queen takes a2, knight takes d4, knight takes c7, bishop h5, h5. Okay, and of course, attacking the queen is is more um, of more priority than attacking another piece. We could also look at g6, attacking a bishop and a5. You know, we could look at bishop a5, we could look at bishop d6. Of course, there are a lot of moves, but intuitively, some moves you will spend one second or less, right? Of course, queen takes d4, you will not consider for long, or queen takes e5, right? But by going through these moves and making kind of a habit, you're not going to miss a move which just gives you an immediate win like here. So h5, I looked if there's any chance for white if he can sacrifice the queen, but it's just nothing here, just nothing here. Uh, this is not even threatening a perpetual, but black can also just play queen e4 stopping, it's just completely winning. Okay, you played rook d7, rook takes, bishop takes, 
a3, bishop e1, good move, rook f3, knight bishop c6, king of 1, bishop a5. But now you build up a good setup, right? You, this looks all very harmonious. Black, uh, white cannot push you away from d5 anymore. He cannot mobilize his pawns. So you're doing absolutely okay here. Rook g3. And now you actually set it on a draw, which I can understand from the course of your game was like a roller coaster, right? Uh, first you were fine, but then you didn't free yourself and then you came under this attack and it looked really bad for you. And uh, then, um, okay, you had this chance to win, but you didn't see it, so you didn't even know about it. And uh, then you were probably just happy that you could escape with a draw here. But here, you're actually better. Um, you could play bishop b6 here and go after his d4 pawn and it's white who has to prove equality, not you. And I just read, I just read an interview with Anna um, and there was a question about Karpov and it was something about that Karpov had the skill of always forgetting all the moves that were played before in the game. Of course, he was not actually forgetting them, but he was playing like all that mattered was the current position, the present position on the board. And why is that important? Because if you see this position for the first time and you don't have this, you don't carry this baggage with you, like from the game, this emotional roller coaster, maybe in this case, where you were pretty much lost a lot of, for most of the game, um, then you can just take a fresh look. You can just say, okay, hold on a minute. Why, why am I not better here? Why can't I just play? So Karpov was really good just switching. He was one moment he was losing, but then he came back and he played for a win. And he didn't give a draw or anything just because he was like, oh, uh, I was worse before, so I'm happy with a draw. No, he was relentless. He would just play a position and see what's possible and press and see if he can win. Um, so learn something from Karpov here with bishop b6. You could have pressed uh, probably, I mean, King G1 is already the best move. Uh, that's not an easy move to make, I think. Uh, quite counterintuitive, I think. King G1. And then the best white gets is this endgame, where with best play it should be uh, equal, but it's definitely black who's trying here. So um, that was a good chance to, to keep playing. So take something from Cup of there. <laughs> Forget everything that happened in the game and just focus on the present position. Uh, but even Anand said it's not easy for him. It's, it's one of his weak spots that he's kind of uh, influenced by what happened before in the game. But he knows about it, so he tries to kind of counter it. But um, it's just something to consider maybe next time you come back from a worse position. Or you, you might still in your mind think you're worse when you're actually not. Right? All right, let me check the chat. I'm not sure if you were actually here today. Uh, King Hunter doesn't look like it. But I hope when you see this, when you get to see this, and um, you have any questions, then just reach out to me and let me know. And other than that, okay, let me say a quick summary about this game. I think you need to be a little bit more familiar with maybe with the opening or at least the plants and also the sacrifice. I mean, now you know it, but um, you need to know that when you don't free yourself and you have this knight on d7, like you saw in this game, you're really risking to get steamrolled and that's what you don't want to happen, right? So you were just very fortunate here that white wasn't able to finish his attack and he made a few inaccuracies on the way. And then the other big, big, big thing, of course, was this uh, double oversight from both of you, rook c7, and then you could win with h5 on the spot. And that's where you just candid moves, solve tactics, and always do the scan of the candid moves, uh, looking for all the moves that take something or give a check or threaten something. Just all moves that force some kind of reaction by your opponent, right? Those, those are moves to check for sure. All right, King Hunter, I hope this analysis was helpful for you. And if you have any questions, just let me know. To everybody else, I'll 